Okay, Sergeant Martinez, can you please start your recording? You see, recording is underway. Backup is rolling. Uh, rolling. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the New York City Council Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings, and Dispositions. <coughs> oh, excuse me. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff please turn on the video for verification purposes. Please place any cell phones and electronic devices to silent or vibrate to minimize disruptions throughout the hearing. If you have any testimony to submit for the record, you can do so by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Mr. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good afternoon. I am Kevin Riley, Chair of the Subcommittee of Landmarks, Public Sighting and Dispositions. I am joined remotely today by Council Members Ku and Council Member Barron. Today, we'll be holding a public hearing on a school site and submitted by the School Construction Authority, an affordable housing project submitted by HPD, and a landmark designation submitted by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Before we begin, I recognize the subcommittee council to review today's hearing procedures. Thank you, Chair Riley. I am Jeffrey Campania, counsel to the subcommittee. Members of the public who wish to testify were asked to register for today's hearing. If you wish to testify and have not registered, please go to www.council.nyc.gov to sign up now. If you are a member of the public who wants to watch this hearing, please watch the hearing on the New York City Council website. All people testifying before the subcommittee will be on mute until they are recognized to testify. When the chair recognizes you, please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit in lieu, of a, a, in lieu of appearing before the subcommittee, you can email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or project name in the subject line of the email. During the hearing, council members who would like to ask questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear on the bottom of the participant panel. I will announce council members who have questions in the order that they raise their hands. Chair Riley will then recognize members to speak. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until they are excused by the chair. Lastly, there may be extended pauses if we encounter technical problems. We ask that you please be patient as we work through these issues. Chair Riley will now continue with today's agenda items. Thank you, Councillor. We begin today with the public hearing on the pre-considered land use related to application number 20215009SCK, submitted by the New York City School Construction Authority, pursuant to section 1731 of the Public Authorities Law. The application requests approval of a proposed site selection for a new approximately 475 seat intermediate school facility on the former site of St. Catherine of Alexandria School at 4002 Fort Hamilton Parkway in Community School District 15 in the council district represented by Council Member Lander. Council, please call on the applicant panel. The applicant panel for the School Construction Authority is Gail Mandaro, Tammy Rachelson, and Tamar Smith. Council, please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands and state your names. Please unmute the panelists. Do we have Gail Mandaro, Tammy Rachelson, and Tamar Smith? One moment, please, while we get the SCA panel. Good afternoon. We have Tamar Smith. Yes. Is Tammy Rachelson here? Uh, yes, yes, I am. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was thrown out for a minute. Sorry. Do you have video? Uh, I can are, you, see, are you here by phone? I can see you. Can see <laughs> Nothing you. else. But I yeah. can you see me? We cannot see you. Oh, we can't. 
Can you hear me? Um, we can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, then we'll take this verbally. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. yes. Chair, you may begin the hearing. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation again for your record. You both may begin. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Riley and Council members. Are we having video pro uh, audio problems? I was just knocked out uh, for a moment, but I think it's back. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, Tammy. Okay, I'm going to start again. Um, good afternoon, Chair R Person Riley and Council members. Before we begin the testimony, if you are a member of the public who wishes to testify, please register on the City Council website at council.nyc.gov. Please visit the City Council Oops. website to watch live streams of all City Council meetings to find recordings of previously held meetings. Um, my name is Tammy Rachelson and I'm the Senior Manager for Project Operations in the New York City School Construction Authority's Real Estate Services Department. Also with me is Tamar Smith, Community Relations Manager for the School Construction Authority. The New York City School Construction Authority has undertaken the site selection process for a new, approximately 475-seat intermediate school facility located on block 5597 on a portion of lot 38 in the borough of Brooklyn. The site contains a total of approximately 21,000 square feet of lot area, which equates to approximately 0.48 acres and is located on the southwest side of Fort Hamilton Parkway, the northeast side of 41st Street and the southwest side of 40th Street. The site is comprised of a portion of a large lot that's privately owned in the Sunset Park slash Borough Park section of Brooklyn and is vacant and unimproved. The site is located in Brooklyn Community School District 12 and Community Board 12 and Community School District 15. Under the proposed project, the SCA would acquire the site and construct a new approximately 475 seat intermediate school facility. The notice of filing for the site plan was published in the post and city record on October 21st, 2020, at which time Community Education Council 15, Brooklyn Community Board 12 and the City Planning Commission were also notified of the site plan. The CEC and Community Board were asked to hold public hearings on the proposed site plan. The CEC 15 held a public hearing on November 2nd, 2020. Written comments were not received from the CEC Community Board and the City Planning Commission. The SEA has received considered all comments received on the proposed site plan and infirms the site plan pursuant to section 1731 of the New York Public Authorities Law. In accordance with section 1732 of the Public Authorities Law, the SCA submitted the proposed site plan to the mayor and the city council by letter dated January 19th, 2021. We look forward to your subcommittee's favorable consideration of the proposed site plan and are prepared to answer questions from the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, I, I, I guess I just have one question. I know originally uh, this proposal was supposed to be an elementary school and it transitioned into an intermediate school. Can you just speak on why that proposal happened? Um, yes, but I'm gonna ask Tamar who's was more involved with the process than I was. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Tamar Smith, Community Relations Manager at the SCA. Um, thank you, Chairman Riley. The, uh, you're, you're correct at first. Um, so first I'll say that need for both kinds of seats exists in this community, um, both elementary and middle school. However, so it, it was a flexible plan and it could have been either one. Um, when the project was first 
spoken about with community members. Um, a, a good many of them asked about whether it could be a middle school, um, as that's also you know a great need in the community. Um, and so from community feedback, the D Office of District Planning at the DOE, uh, the SCA, the superintendent, you know, and other stakeholders, parents as well, had these discussions. Um, and it was agreed that a middle school would be a really, really needed um, and positive addition to the community. Um, and so that's how the decision was made to change the, the level. Okay. So it did have uh, community input and that's why they went. Yes. All right. Yes. So that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have any questions, just a statement. Uh, this is my first uh, committee meeting and I'm so elated that my first decision and vote will be um, implementing a new school within our community. Uh, this is so imperative, especially through a pandemic now. So I, I look forward to working with you all uh, moving forward. And now I would just like to invite my colleagues, if there are any questions, uh, if you have any questions for the panel, please click on the raise hand button on the participant panel. Uh, council, are there any council member questions? I do see we have council member Machaka um, hand is raised. Uh, council member Machaka, did you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And congratulations on this incredible uh, post. This is a very important committee uh, because you get to see uh, schools blossom. Uh, and in Sunset Park, where we have seven plus <laughs> schools on their way uh, in the district, uh, we couldn't find a better partner than the community itself, uh, our parents, our, our schools, our parents, and the School Construction Authority. Uh, and so Tamar, hello, good to see you again. I hope you're doing well in this pandemic. I know we're still in the middle of it, but I hope you and your family and everyone is doing well. Uh, Chair, I just wanted to say how excited I am that Angel Guardian Home uh, today, uh, and, and this is really just the, the kind of conversations that we're having later in the uh, in the docket, but I wanted to make the, and actually, can I, Chair, can I make remarks on uh, Angel Guardian Home now, or should I wait for later? Uh, sure, go ahead. Okay, great. I just have to jump off. And, and so this committee will be looking at Angel Guardian Home and this is in Diker Heights. And this committee will be considering the first historic landmark. Uh, and I have met with community members and many times, uh, in not just the last year, the year before. And there is huge support for the landmarking and the preservation of the site, uh, both the architectural quality and the history of Angel Guardian. Uh, and there is great value in bringing that kind of landmarking for, for this building, the first of its kind. Uh, but we also know that LPC is well aware that there is also disappointment and frustration in the community. The landmarking is gonna exclude a, the beautiful Mercy building uh, and that just means we're gonna lose it. Uh, but I do hope that this committee, uh, when it comes up for a vote, votes in support of that landmark. Uh, and again, congratulations, Chair, and hello to the SCA for bringing us yet another school uh, in front of the City Council. I am incredibly grateful as well, and good luck, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Machaka. And I am aware of that, uh, the other uh, part of the Angels Guardian Home, and, and definitely will be bringing up questions uh, when that time comes. Uh, Council, are there any more questions pertaining to the intermediate school, Sian? If there are any other council members who have questions, please use the raise hand button now. I see no other members with questions. If there are no more questions for this panel, this panel is excused. Thank you. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? There are no members of the public signed up to testify on this item. There being no members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on application number 202-15009 SCK is now closed. The subcommittee will now vote on this item. Council, please call the roll. 
Council Member Riley. Present. Aye. Baron. Oh, I'm sorry. Ku. Please unmute Council Member Ku. Yeah, I will. Aye. Council Member Barron. Uh, thank you. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you. First, I want to welcome Council Member Riley as the chair. Welcome him to the council and say that we're glad that you're here uh, on behalf of the community that you represent. Uh, in terms of the school construction, as many of you know, my previous life before legislation, before being in this arena was in fact in education. So it, I'm always excited to know that we are taking the time and the effort and recognizing the importance of building beautiful new buildings for our children to be able to engage in their learning processes. So I very hardly vote aye on this project. Thank you. By a vote of three in the affirmative, uh, zero in the negative and with zero abstentions, the item is recommended to the full land use committee. We will keep the vote open. Thank you, council. Our next item is land use 711, the 110 Lenox Avenue a and CP cluster. This item is an application submitted by the Department of Housing Preve Pres Preservation and Development pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law, requesting waiver of designation, requirements and the requirement of Section 197C and 197D of the Charter, approval of an urban development action area project and approval of real property tax exemption for properties located at 110 Lenox Avenue, 128 West 116th Street, and 1971 7th Avenue in the Manhattan Council District, represented by Council Member Perkins. I, I don't believe Council Member Perkins. Perkins is here, so you may continue. Council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel for this application is Christine O'Connell and Sarah Mallory on behalf of HPD and Chris Bramwell on behalf of CB Emanuel Realty. Council, please administer the affirmation. Before I do that, I understand that Council Member Traeger is here, if I may. Yes. Um, Council Member Traeger, we are voting on the uh, school designation. Are you there? Please unmute Council Member Traeger. Yes, I, I'm here. Uh, how do you vote on the siting of the school? Vote aye. Thank you. That's four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions. I believe, uh, uh, Council Member Miller also joined us. Council Member Miller. Uh, how do you vote on this item? We are voting on the uh, setting of the school in uh, Councilmember Landers. It's a very district. narrow box. You can work with it. Oh, hold on. Uh, am I up? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hey, Councilmember, how are you? Look good in that seat, man. Uh, thank you, brother. Just, just so that you know. Uh, I, and I, I, I vote aye. I. I don't know. Thank you. By a vote of five in the affirmative, with zero in the negative, zero abstentions, the item is uh, recommended to the full land use committee, and the vote is now closed. Um, now, do we have our panelists for 110 Lennox? Again, the panelists are Christine O'Connell, I see Sarah Mallory, and Chris Bramwell. I see you all. Panelists, could you please raise your right hands? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Please unmute yourselves. I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and aff affiliation again for the record. You may begin. 
Great. Uh, thank you so much for having us here today. My name is Sarah Mallory. I am the Acting Assistant Commissioner for Government Affairs at HPD. Uh, and I will go ahead and start my testimony. Item number 711 consists of the proposed disposition of four partially occupied city owned buildings and the approval of Article 11 tax benefits for properties located at 110 Lenox Avenue, Block 1599, Lot 70, 128 West 116th Street, Block 1825, Lot 49, 102 West 119th Street, Block 1903, Lot 38, and 1971 7th Avenue, Block 1903, Lot 64, and Manhattan Council District 9. Known as the 110 Lenox Avenue ANCP cluster, the buildings will be developed through HPD's Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program. Under the program guidelines, city-owned and multiple dwellings are conveyed to restoring communities HDFC for $1 per tax lot and then rehabilitated by private developers selected through a competitive process. The developer will sign a site development and management agreement with restoring communities that will be in effect until co-op conversion occurs and title transfers from restoring communities HDFC to the individual cooperative. From the time of the cooperative conversion, the developer will remain the property manager for at least one year. After the first year, the co-op will have the choice of keeping the developer as property manager or hire a new company approved by HPD. All of the buildings entered into city ownership through an in-rem foreclosure process. 110 Lenox Avenue entered city ownership in 1980 and joined the tenant interim lease program in or till in 2000. 128 West 116th Street became city owned in 1988 and joined the till program in 2001. 102 West 119th Street became city owned in 1977 and joined the till program in 2002 and then transferred to the Division of Property Management in 2018. And finally, 1971 7th Avenue became city owned in 1974 and joined the till program in 2001. As part of the till program, tenants are required to form tenant associations to self manage their buildings, which includes collecting rents under a net lease agreement with HPD. The cluster is comprised of 55 units and the residents are ready to move forward with the next steps in cooperative conversion under HPD's and program. The de designated developer, CP Emanuel Realty LLC, has been selected to develop the site. The four buildings in this cluster will require a substantial rehabilitation that includes structural joist replacement, replacement of building systems, including electrical upgrades, plumbing upgrades, and the installation of new boilers. Additionally, work to the envelope of the building is needed, including new windows, new roofs, and masonry repair. The scope of work also includes new bathrooms, kitchen fixtures, entry doors, new flooring, new mailboxes, and hallway upgrades, painting, asbestos, and lead removal. Units will also be brought into compliance with current 2014 building code and ADA accessibility requirements. Additionally, 5% of the units will be renovated with accessibility for mobility and 2% for hearing and visually impaired households. Post rehabilitation, the 55 residential units will include seven one bedrooms, 17 two bedrooms, 22 three bedrooms, and nine four bedroom apartments. Of the total unit count, 30 are currently occupied by returning shareholders. Household incomes for existing tenants range between a reported 3% to 88% of area medium income and the cooperative interest attributable to occupied apartments will be sold to the existing tenants for $2,500. Maintenance will be set at 40% AMI for existing tenants, a monthly rent for each unit size for existing tenants as anticipated to be roughly $860 per one bedroom, $1,030 per two bedrooms, and $1,180 per three bedroom, and $1,310 per four bedroom apartment. The cooperative interest attributable to vacant apartments will be sold for a price affordable to families earning no more than 110% of the area median income. In addition to seeking disposition approval for 110 Lenox Avenue ANCP cluster, HPD requests a 40 year Article 11 tax exemption in order to help the shareholders maintain affordability. The term of the tax exemption will be coterminous with the regulatory agreement and the total tax benefit is approximately 7.6 million with the net present value of approximately 2.1 million. In order to facilitate development at 110 Lenox Avenue ANCP cluster, HPD seeks approval of this land use item. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, 
My question is, uh, how many current tenants of the building have elected to purchase uh, units in the co-op? And uh, will they have the option to rent instead of buy-in? Yeah, great question. Uh, could, you, uh, could you unmute uh, Christy Lennox? Yeah, thank you. Hi, this is Christine O'Connell, um, the director of the Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program with HPD. Hey, um, hey. so the 30 existing tenants, um, by participating in the tenant interim lease program, they have indicated their interest in becoming homeowners. Um, we do not actually offer the, the opportunity to purchase until the construction is nearly complete. Uh, the conversion to co-op requires an offering plan approved by the New York State Attorney General, which is a process that we coordinate during construction. Um, residents also have to meet certain criteria in order to become a co-op, including attending homeownership trainings, uh, which we facilitate during construction. Um, and residents also have to be current in rent in order to have the opportunity to buy. So we work with residents during construction to make sure that they remain current in rent. For any resident that does not want to become a homeowner, we absolutely do return them to the renovated building. Um, they will become a rent stabilized tenant and we will provide them with section eight uh, assistance uh, if available as well. Okay. Uh, during the rehabilitation of the building, is there a relocation plan for the tenants uh, while this is uh, occurring? Yes. So we've been working with CV Emanuel Realty LLC, our assigned developer, to make that plan to relocate families. Um, one of the buildings in the cluster has already been relocated um, due to um, the condition of the building. And the relocation was done in tandem with CB Emanuel. Um, the other three buildings will be relocated after we have a construction loan closing, um, which we hope to have by May of this year. Um, we work with the individual tenants, assess their needs, move them to comparable apartments within the same geographic proximity um, so that we can make sure that the process is as seamless as possible. Okay. And my last question is, is there a, a reason why HPD decided that the AMIs for the vacant units um, would be set at 110% uh, to 120% of AMIs? Yes, so the way that we finance the rehab of these buildings is there's a mix. There's uh, HPD city capital. Our term sheet is about $200,000 a unit. There's also a private bank that comes in and funds the construction. And we get grants from the state of New York through the Affordable Housing Co Corporation. What happens is we want to pay down that private loan as much as possible so that it doesn't become permanent debt and then increase the monthly maintenance fee. Um, the way that we can pay down that construction loan is by having sales of vacant apartments uh, come in and pay down the loan. The, the AMIs uh, are set about 110, but it, it's still something that we're working on trying to finalize the budget. Um, so we do expect that the sale prices will be somewhere between 105 and 110. And the only thing I'll add on top of that is whenever possible, we do try to go deeper into uh, our affordability. Um, that's our mission and our goal always. Uh, it just always will also depend on the finances of the building to make sure that it is sustainable for all tenants going forward. So there, there's no issues um, of future displacement. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm going to yield my time to my other council members who have any questions. I see council member Barron has her hand raised. Council member Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to the panel for coming. I just have a couple of questions. I may have missed some of the information and I apologize for that. How many apartments are presently occupied in the buildings that you plan to renovate? 30, uh, 30 units are occupied out of 55. 30 out of 55. Mm -hmm. And of the 30, how many have indicated that they are interested in purchasing? And what is the purchase price for those 30? So of, of the 30, um, we three of the buildings will be converted to co-op and one of the buildings will become a rental building. Um, the, the residents in the three buildings that are intended to become co-op, all of them have indicated their interest and willingness to 
pay the purchase price of 2,500 um, at the time of construction completion. And how many is that? All 30? It, it's not all 30 because one of the buildings will become a rental. Um, and so for that building, um, those units will not be sold. Opening the... So is there an opportunity for someone who's in the rental building to purchase a co-op in the other buildings? No. Oh. Um, the the building... That. If they were interested in it, why can't they be offered that opportunity? So 22 out of the 30 existing families are in the buildings that are intended to become co-op. Uh, 102 West 119th Street had been in the till program for a, a number of years and did not meet the criteria to continue in the program. So the criteria were regular rent payment, submission of monthly financial reports, um, and also annual elections. HPD till the tenant interim lease program work with that building for a number of years to ensure that they meet the criteria, but um, through um, multiple attempts and through also a corrective action plan, the building was unable to meet the criteria and was terminated from the program. The building is still being renovated. Uh, the building will still have um, affordability restrictions and the residents will be offered Section 8 assistance in order to ensure that they can afford the, the restructured rent after the completion of construction. So first residents in the rental building, that would be what, about eight of them? Okay. And right. what would be the change in their rentals amount? Today, the those units pay somewhere between $250 to $350 a month in rent. Um, when we complete the renovation, uh, we're expecting that those units will pay somewhere between 800. Oh, um, that's a problem. <laughs> it's a difference. It is definitely a difference. Huge increase. And that's why we provide Section 8 subsidy in order to make sure that residents don't have a financial hardship as a result of the renovation. The, the truth of the matter is the rents that the city of New York collects from these buildings today is not enough to fund the operations of the building. The city of New York is paying the majority of the cost to fund fuel and um, maintenance and um, you know, other upkeep. And so once we do the renovation of the building and the building is no longer in city ownership, there's a, a required rent restructure in order to make sure we can fund the operations. But like I said, in order to ensure that the existing residents don't have a financial hardship, we prioritize Section 8 for those, those residents. And we guide them through the process. It is, it is definitely a process that we, um, you know, we make multiple outreach attempts. We, we have folks on staff that are reaching out and, and doing everything they can to help them gather documents and make sure that they successfully obtain a voucher if that's what they want. So of the other residents, the 22 yep. remaining residents, they will all be eligible to go into the co-op that will be established. Right. And um, how many do we know are interested in doing that? And what will happen to the others that don't want to purchase as a co-op? To our knowledge, all 22 of the families that live in the other three buildings are interested in purchasing. Um, if any resident through, through the process decides home ownership is not for them, they don't want to participate in home ownership, they will still be come home to a renovated building. Um, they will become a rent stabilized tenant instead. They will pay the same amount of maintenance that we, or rent that we quoted previously. So about 860 for a one bedroom. Um, the only difference is they won't, they won't be able to participate in the board. Um, but they will definitely come home and they will be protected under rent stabilization. What is the average rent now in that development for a one bedroom? You said the, uh, after renovations, it'll be approximately 860 for one bedroom. What is it presently? It's uh, again, it's between 250 and 350 while these buildings are still in city ownership. And again, that 800 is a number that includes section eight housing in order to help fill the gap. Mm -hmm. 
Well, is there a guarantee that all of them will get Section 8? No, there's not a guarantee, but of all of the HPD programs that, um, that we work on, this is the one where the, with the greatest demonstrated need. These rents have not been changed in decades, uh, which is why they are so low. Um, that's okay. Uh, and so it, we prioritize Section 8 for ANCP tenants. Um, more, I would, I can't say more than other programs, but we definitely understand the need for this program versus other privately owned buildings. Um, okay, I've got lots of concerns about the project. Um, I do know that CB Emanuel has done some work locally also. So thank you for your presentation and thank you to the chair. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Um, I have one last question, um, if there's no other question from council members, and this is for CB Emanuel Realty. I'm just interested on the community engagement efforts, um, being that you guys are coming into the community. Um, what has been the engagement efforts with the residents, um, and do you plan on formulating a resident association board? Can someone please unmute Chris? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Chris. Good afternoon, Chair and, and, and members. Um, your question about the community engagement. Uh, we've been in that community for some time now. Um, we're working with a lot of Canaan Baptist Church is actually one of our clients that we work with, with the, the senior buildings, the MOYT, um, and also their their family uh, housing as well. So we're, we're pretty uh, instilled in that community, and we've been engaged with these residents as well. We've had a number of of resident uh, meetings kind of helping because they, they're part of the design. So as we're redesigning these buildings for them, we've engaged them with the architects and, and had a number of meetings. So, and as far as associations, yes, I, I think that that is the only way to make these co-ops successful is if they have associations and they kind of work as a business. So um, we're very much so um, for associations and, and kind of getting them set up so that they can survive. Thank you, Chris. And how long have you guys been in the community? I'm sorry. Uh, I've been working for Canaan probably for the last 10 years, um, maybe longer, actually. Um, and we've also done projects up higher in Harlem, up on 146th Street with a veteran group. Um, we, we've done some housing uh, where we partnered with them. But I've been in, in the Harlem area probably for the last 10 to 12 years. Thank you, Chris. No problem. There being no more questions for this panel, this panel is excused. Oh, sorry. No, one moment. Yes, Councilmember Barron has another question. Mayor has a question. Sorry, Councilmember Barron. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I do have another question. So the selling price for those who are presently living there is going to be two thousand five hundred. Right. What is the price for those who don't presently live there but would be interested in purchasing, becoming an owner, a co-op owner? Sure. So our sale prices for the vacant apartments, um, there are one, two, three, and four bedroom apartments available for sale after the renovation is complete. Um, a one bedroom apartment would be 339. A two bedroom apartment would be 407,000. A three bedroom apartment would be 471,000. And a four bedroom would be 525,000. So, Vacant apartments will be sold at, give me that again, a one bedroom will be sold. 339. 339, a two bedroom 407, a three bedroom 471, and a four bedroom $525,000? Yes. That's another factor. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Council member Miller has a question. Councilmember Miller. Councilmember Miller, are you does there? This pro does this program uh, allow for community preference? No, um, this is something that we've, we've addressed that for projects where there are returning families, the community preference has already been met. 
Um, so, so was it, yeah, we go through this all the time and it's built in, but therein lies the problem and, and how do we maintain the, the, and, 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 and address the concerns of wealth building within communities of color and, and certainly to address gentrification if in fact that, you know, that doesn't happen. Of course, you just can't put out the people that are already there. That, that's, that's kind of a given. You know, how, how do we get beyond that? And are there any subsidies afforded to those new homeowners um, at, for this project for moving forward? How, how do you kind sure. of mitigate those steep prices that we're seeing? Sure. So the, the first thing I want to mention is that there is a New York City preference, although it is not a community board preference, it is a New York City preference, and that the developer is responsible for advertising the opportunity. So by reaching out to local elected officials to promote the opportunity, um, by having a local localized seminar, which is hopefully by then we will be having in-person meetings again, um, and we can have members of the community come and hear about the project and, and you know ask questions if they have any. Um, as it relates to opportunities for subsidy, HPD has a Home First um, down payment assistance program um, that I believe currently provides up to $25,000 in down payment assistance. Um, there are other lenders that we work with that also provide down payment assistance, which could be layered. Um, you know, these, these are definitely opportunities for, uh, for some of our banks to, or partner banks uh, to provide um, assistance for lower income families to be able to come into this opportunity and, and become a first time home buyer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member Miller. And thank you, Council Member Barron for your amazing questions. Uh, if there are no more questions for this panel, this panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify? There are no, there are no members of the public signed up to testify for this item. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on land use 711 is now closed. Our last item today is the pre-considered land use related to application number 20215011 HIK, the Landmark Preservation Commission Historic Landmark Designation of the Angels Guardian Home located at 6301 12th Avenue Block 5739, part of Lot 1 in Borough of Brooklyn in the Council District, represented by Council Member Machaca. Council Member Machaca gave his remarks earlier. Um, I just wanted to note that for the record. Thank you, Council Member Machaca, for giving your remarks earlier. He had to step out uh, to another event. Council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel for LPC is Kate Lemos Mikhail and Anthony February. Council, please administer the affirmation. One moment while we wait for the panelists to be admitted to the room. Panelists, please raise your right hands and state your names. I'm Kate Lemus McHale. Anthony Fabre. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the whole truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? I do. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation again for the record, then you may begin. Uh, thank you. I'm Kate Lemus McHale, the Director of Research for the Landmarks Preservation Commission. And I'm Anthony Fabre, Director of Intergovernmental and Community Affairs at uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission. We had sent over a presentation. Is that available to go through? One moment while we load oh, the presentation. <laughs> great. Okay, can you see it? Yep, I can. Thanks. Shall I just start? Yes, you could go ahead and start. Sorry okay. about that. Go ahead. Okay, no problem. Thanks so much, Chair Riley. It's great to see you and I look forward to working with you here. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Angel Guardian Home in Diker Heights, Brooklyn, which was designated on November 10th 
2020 as a New York City landmark. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? The Angel Guardian Home was designed in 1897 by George H. Streeton for the Sisters of Mercy, who operated it as an orphanage until the late 1970s. Prominently elevated on a raised lawn surrounded by a historic stone wall, the monumental Renaissance revival and Beaux-Arts style building is an enduring reminder of the role played by religious social service organizations in Brooklyn's early 20th century history. And it stands out within the surrounding low scale residential streetscape. On August 11th of 2020, LPC held a public hearing on the proposed designation of the Angel Guardian Home. 16 people spoke in favor of designation, including the property owners, Council Member Justin Brannon, representatives from Community Board 10, the Historic Districts Council, the City Club of New York, the Diker Heights Civic Association, the Guardians of the Guardian, and six individuals. Several of these people also asked the commission to designate another building on the site as well. No one spoke in opposition. The commission also received 69 letters in favor of designation, including one from Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams and one from Council Member Justin Brannon, Senator Andrew Grunardis, and Assembly Member Peter J. Abate Jr. signing jointly. Among these letters was a joint letter from Council Member Carlos Menchaca uh, signing jointly with um, Brooklyn Community Board 10 and several advocates. Uh, and we did also receive an email campaign recognizing the significance of the Angel Guardian Home and asking the commission to designate another building on the site. Uh, next, please. This is the first landmark in Diker Heights. The landmark site is located on 12th Avenue between 63rd and 64th Street, encompassing the historic uh, main building of the Angel Guardian Home and its north and south wings and the entire 12th Avenue frontage, including its front lawn and historic stone wall surrounding it. Next slide, please. Historically part of the town of New Utrecht, shown on the left in an 1873 atlas, this neighborhood remained a sparsely developed suburb that was considered part of Long Island until it was annexed to the city of Brooklyn in 1894 and then incorporated into Greater New York City in 1898. Diker Heights began to develop in the 1880s and early 1890s, and at this time, uh, the block was under the ownership of the Sisters of Mercy. Uh, next slide, please. The Sisters of Mercy are a Catholic religious order founded in Ireland in 1831 by Catherine Macaulay. They arrived in New York in 1846 and opened an orphanage on Second Avenue in Manhattan in 1860. They expanded their charitable activities in the city in response to an increase in New York's Catholic population in the late 1800s. On the left is an image of their convent in um, Clinton Hill, Brooklyn in the 19th century. They also opened a campus in Syosset, Long Island as an orphanage for boys and from 1880 to 1892 acquired the large parcels, parcels of land in Diker Heights. In 1897, the Sisters of Mercy hired the architect George H. Streeton, a notable designer of ecclesiastical buildings to design the Angel, Garden, Angel Guardian Home on the Diker Heights site. Uh, which is shown on the right. Uh, next slide, please. At its opening in 1899, the Angel Guardian Home originally consisted of just a four-story main building, which was extended uh, by around 1910 to include north and south wings containing a school, administrative functions, and a chapel. In addition to housing children waiting for adoption placement, by 1906, the Angel Guardian Home also offered a residence for unwed mothers. Behind the prominent main building, a nursery building was constructed on 63rd Street in 1906, and a boiler house and other utilitarian structures were also constructed on the site. The historic stone wall seen in this historic photo is um, at the site's 12th Avenue frontage, was extended in the 1920s with a high brick wall that encircled the entire block east of the main building. Uh, next, please. The distinguished main building that housed the orphanage occupies a full block front of 12th Avenue, consists of a central section rising four stories above a raised base with a three-story north wing that contained classrooms and offices and a two-story chapel extension to the south. The design of the original central portion blended Renaissance revival and Beaux-Arts style elements 
And these were styles that were popular in use at the time to impart a sense of grandeur and civic purpose. The wings were designed in the same blend of styles. Um, the building features red brick with limestone trim, a copper cornice, mansard roof embellished with carved limestone door surrounds um, and other decorative details. Um, the combination of its sophisticated architectural style with its monumental civic scale and elevated position on an expansive lawn makes the Angel Guardian Homes main building highly prominent um, on the site and within its neighborhood. Next slide, please. These are views of the building from 63rd Street on the left and 64th Street on the right. The wings, as I said, have similar architectural treatment to the main building. Um, the rear facade of the main building is less embellished than its 12th Avenue facade, and a tall brick chimney and some modest utilitarian extensions were added over the years. Uh, next, please. The Angel Guardian Home main building is prominent within the site and community of Diker Heights. Its significance is derived from a combination of its historic importance as the original orphanage building, housing the primary functions of the Angel Guardian Home social services, its architectural quality, its civic monumentality, and its prominence. Other buildings on the site do not possess the same combination of factors. Uh, next, please. The Sisters of Mercy operated the Angel Guardian Home in Diker Heights for close to 120 years as an orphanage and residence for unwed mothers until the 1980s, expanding the focus of their social service work to include foster care in the 1960s and later providing senior assisted living on the site. They sold the property in 2018 with a deed restriction stipulating certain uses to serve the community consistent with the sister's mission. Uh, next, please. And to conclude, the elegantly designed Angel Guardian home with its monumental civic scale and adept blend of Renaissance revival and Beaux-Arts architectural details is symbolic of the importance given to social services in the progressive era and the role of the Sisters of Mercy in Brooklyn for over a century. The distinctive and remarkably intact main building is significant um, within Diker Heights and I hope the council will vote to uphold this landmark designation. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Is that the end of your presentation? Yes, it is. Thank okay. you. I'm available okay. for questions, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I know landmarks like this usually happen when a building is being threatened to be demolished or remodeled. So is there any effort that LPC puts um, to landmark any designations uh, prior to that happening uh, before any um, specific landmarks are being demolished or, or spoken about being demolished? Or is there any effort that LPC does prior to that even happening um, to designate any landmarks? Yes, the, the agency is always surveying and researching and identifying potential landmarks throughout the city. Um, the research department, um, which is the part of the agency that does this work is, is really, um, we do geographic surveys, we do surveys by theme, building type, historical significance to identify buildings that um, throughout the city. So there are times that buildings are threatened um, that we have not yet designated obviously. And so there is a process of review um, and evaluation of significance and whether they merit designation. Anthony? Yeah, sorry. I, I think Kate kind of um, mentioned this, but um, I mean, we look at buildings even when they're not um, necessarily being threatened by development. So um, that sometimes does occur that that is the case, but um, it's not what leads us to necessarily look at a building. We're always looking across the city, like, like Kate mentioned. It doesn't have to be um, because we believe the building is threatened. And I just want to echo um, Councilmember Machaca before he, uh, in his remarks, he did mention that there is another building located on that landmark. Um, and I just want to understand why was uh, only one building, which was the main building on uh, landmark and not that building, um, even though many people in the community wanted both buildings to be landmark. Is there any specific reason why it was just the bigger building that was landmark opposed to the smaller building? Yes, I mean, we did a lot of very careful 
um, review and evaluation. We spoke a lot with community members um, and others about this. It's a very large site and there is a complex set of development plans for it that are in you know, keeping with the sisters mission for community services there. Our focus really was on merit and what really represents um, the best way of preserving what is significant about this site. And in our evaluation, the main building with its architectural prominence, um, its physical prominence on the site, its full block front really is the most essential part of this site to preserve. Okay, uh, Council, I'm going to yield my time to see if there's any questions from any of my colleagues. I don't see any questions uh, from any of the council members. Uh, there being no more questions for this panel, this panel is excused. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? I think, Jeff, you're on mute. There are no members of the public signed up to testify on this item. Okay. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify, the public hearing on application number 2021-5011 HIK, the landmark designation of Angel Guardian Home. The public hearing on this and all open items are now closed and laid over. That concludes today's business. I remind you that if you have written testimony on today's item, you may submit it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the land use number or the project name in the subject heading. I would like to thank the applicants, the member of public, my colleagues, subcommittee council, land use staff, especially, and the Sergeant at Arms for participating in today's hearing. This meeting.